All right, all right, all right. <clears throat> Let's get fired up here. Maximum freedom. Read. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Stay on target. Maximum freedom. Read Rothbard. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the next, last episode of the final episode of Read Rothbard Podcast. This is a Martin Luther King Day special. We've got some news to let you guys know about. Um, we're not going away by any stretch. We're just going to retire this name and remorph into something uh, beautiful with anarchy in the name. Uh, we've also got a special guest who's going to be coming on with us in a few minutes. But first, I want to say hello to Robert. How are you doing, Robert? Bigger, faster, and stronger. Hello, all you sexy people. Yeah, so Robert, why don't you just allay their fears real quick and, and give them a rundown of what, what our plan here is. Uh, Daniel's got some master final solution plan to... Uh, finally spread the message of our anarchy propaganda out to more and more people to help us with uh, searches and just generally in marketing purposes. So we are going to be switching over to the name Actual Anarchy, where we are going to still do the same thing. We're still going to be reviewing movies from a libertarian perspective, a philosophical reviews type situation. You know how we do it. If you've heard any of our episodes, that's what we do. Um, but we'll be pointing out you know, instances of actual anarchy in the world. We'll be making a case for what we see as anarchy as opposed to the kind of social communistic view or the lefty scared statist view that it's some sort of machine gun warlord Mad Max scenario. So we'll be making a case for our free market freedom based peace and anarchy and love and beauty. And uh, we'll also be wrapping things all together into some sort of a violent hierarchy, because right, because all, all hierarchies are violent, Daniel. Um, even we'll even have, the voluntary ones. That's right. That's right. Um, and what, is, what are the names of our different heads? I, I'm not even sure. We've got, we've got actual anarchy. We still have Reed Rothbard. And then we've got Enemy of the State, which um, will still exist. But then we've got, what is our, our hierarchical um, overlord name? Uh, we're going to throw everything under kind of this blanket page called Libertarian Union, but readrothbard.com will exist as its own page. Actual Anarchy will exist as its own page, and we're going to have three podcasts. So we're going to continue on with the Read Rothbard podcast, but that's going to actually be audiobooks of um, articles and books by Murray Rothbard. We've got Enemy of the State, which are lectures by Murray Rothbard and him actually speaking. And then Actual Anarchy is going to be uh, what, like Robert was saying, what we already do now, where we take movies and cultural events and talk about them from the Rothbardian and anarcho capitalist perspective. Boom. Yeah, so it's gonna be this whole wide uh like empire, you know, this property loving, freedom loving just group of individuals who just wanna get the message out there of what actual anarchy is, highlighting actual events of anarchy in their lives, which, you know, if you read that uh, Molly New book 90 to 95 percent of your everyday interactions with with uh, other people are in a state of anarchy, and so we hope to highlight a lot of those situations and let you, even if you're not familiar with it, realize that that's uh, that's how you're already living. Yeah, it's just this tiny little part where you think that the government needs to step in and do things, which isn't anarchy. But every other decision you're making in your life, whether it's to buy one brand of pasta or another, or it's whether to befriend the guy down the street or not, or which car to buy, or where to work, all these decisions are all pure anarchy, and you shouldn't be afraid of them because anarchy is nothing to be afraid of. So yeah, indeed. And I think what Robert meant to say instead of pure anarchy, he meant to say actual anarchy. You know, we have to stay on message, right? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> don't listen to that guy. All right, so with uh, that housekeeping aside, um, let's continue on with the final episode of the Read Rothbard podcast, and let's introduce our guest. I think he's probably ready by now. His name is Ryan Jones, and he blogs over at theafrolibertarian.com. Uh, Ryan and I met at the Tom Woods Elite Group, 
on the Facebook. And if you're a fan of Tom Woods, um, just become one of the supporting listeners and you'll be able to join the group. It's super awesome being in there. Uh, you don't get the whole um, uh, ad hom, uh, name calling, blocking thing going on. It's one of the only reasons I'm still on Facebook. So uh, Ryan's a good, a good guy who posts a lot of interesting content in there, and I knew that I wanted to reach out to him. So finally was able to. And uh, Ryan, do we have you there? Yes, I'm here. You hear me? Yes, we do, sir. Yeah, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. Pretty good. Glad to be here. Yeah, awesome. So uh, I'm glad that you're here as well. And, um, you know, Robert, uh, we didn't even mention we're going to talk about the movie Selma. Uh, it's a Martin Luther King Day, and uh, Selma was a big event that uh, was a movie a couple of years ago. So we're going to review that film and talk about a lot of the issues that we see coming out of that, uh, any libertarian's perspective. Uh, Ryan's here to join us for that. And uh, before we kick it off, um, Ryan, you want to give us a little bit of background on you and, and maybe how you came to uh, libertarian or anarchist philosophy in your own life? Sure. Uh uh, I've been I've been a uh, guess a libertarian for about a, let's say eh, maybe about eight years now eight or nine years uh, like most people you know the 2008 Ron Paul you know the economic collapse all that stuff kind of woke a lot of people up uh, I was uh, you know for years even before that I, you know I never really fit in I never felt never really felt at home with the Democrats you know I grew up a Democrat in a Democratic household like. You know, 95% of black folks do, you know, but I just never really fit in, never really fit in with the Republicans and the right wing and the ultra conservatives, you know, so I was always in that, I, was just, I just called myself an independent, I, you know, I try to pick who's best, you know, depending on, you know, what values I had at that certain time. Uh, then eventually, you know, eventually, uh, I think someone sent me the Peter Schiff was right video, and that just blew me away how he was able to, you know, how he pretty much predicted everything that was coming years before. And I looked him up, and you know, on his Wikipedia, they talked about the Mises Institute, and I was an economic advisor to Ron Paul, as if he needed one. But then I was like, oh, Ron Paul, I've seen that guy around before. I remember when, you know, I was uh, living in Baton Rouge. I used to live like two blocks from LSU, and uh, I remember one night it was just a whole gang of kids, college kids, with these Ron Paul, full Ron Paul signs. I'm like, oh, who the hell is Ron Paul? You know, but but it was just so exciting. They were excited, and I woke up the next morning, they were. Signs everywhere, signs hanging from bridges, from buildings. I was just like, man, this Ron Paul guy, he must be popular. And I looked him up and talking about, you know, abolishing the Fed, abolishing the IRS, abolishing the Department of Education, abolishing the EPA, abolishing the income tax. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> what did I just stumble along to? This guy's nuts, you know. But, you know, he, he stuck with me. And, that, you know, as I read more, I found out about, you know, Milton Friedman. And I was like, whoa, he's a super libertarian. But then I found out about, you know, Murray Rothbard, and he just, you know, he just lit me on fire. That's when I discovered anarchism, you know, life without the state, you know, and, you know, true freedom. And, of course, that leads you down an even darker path to Tom Woods and Stefan Molyneux and, uh, you know, Lou Rockwell and so many others, you know, the people we listen to today. So I've been here since, man, you know. And I'm, you know, I, like you said earlier, the Tom Woods elite, anybody listening, they should, you know, you, all you got to do is spend like at least five bucks a month, and just one of the perks is being on that that he, uh, the Tom Woods Elite Facebook. There's tons of you know super smart, creative people like you guys exchanging ideas. You know everybody's friendly with each other. We'll challenge each other. We'll argue, but it's nothing nasty. You know it's kind of a, our little safe space. But you know I guess everybody needs a little safe space sometimes, especially out here on these internet streets. So. Yeah, that's it. I'm just here. I'm just you know here to chip in and see what I could offer to the conversation. Yeah, yeah I'm wondering. I'm wondering if any of those, um, all those other Ron and Paul people back in the day, did they kind of disappear. They go away. They turn into like mainstream Republicans or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I'm wondering. If you've got other libertarian friends around in your area because we don't really have a whole lot up here where we're at. No, I don't have many, man. I mean, I didn't. You know, I wasn't. In, I wasn't involved in any groups or anything back then. But I mean, I worked. I worked at that time for the state, for the state of Louisiana, mm -hmm. and just in my IT group, there were three libertarians, two of them, two of them anarchists, not including me. Like wow. what are the odds, you know, <laughs> working for wow. the state government? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you know, those are my close friends. Even one, one guy, he was Indian. He was actually from India. He was an Indian immigrant, and you know, mm -hmm. he was he was a he was a pure anarchist. You know, we we pretty much went down that path together exchanging ideas and stuff like that. So, yeah, it's interesting. You know, I mean, I don't know. I don't think there's a lot of us, but, I mean, you'll be surprised where we turn up. 
Yeah, definitely. That is surprising. But yeah, like we're all exchanging information over the internet. It's a uh, good time to be alive. Yeah, yeah, beat it. Maybe yeah. being right for it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Back then, yeah. we just like a room full of people, <laughs> like libertarian <laughs> gatherings. Yeah, just smo- some smoky room at like you know some little hotel somewhere. Right. You know, yeah. Cranking some about hotel coffee. off the interstate, just everybody getting together, <laughs> <laughs> just drinking coffee. You know, this is a uh, so, uh, Ryan, you actually posted a little bit on your story on uh, your blog, right, on how you came to libertarianism. And I think Robert on our pre-show call was talking about how it made him tear up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, man. It's a, it's a good story. I, uh, I like your writing. It's good. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, personally, I've had no inclination to ever blog, you know, but, you know, if you listen to Tom Woods enough, he kind of badges you into Doing something, you know. <laughs> so, you know, I just said hell with it. I'm gonna start a blog, just get my ideas out. I, I don't have much content on there yet. It's just because I don't have much time. But you know, one day I'm gonna fill that puppy up with a bunch of posts. You know, because I do have a lot of things that float in my mind that I just want to get off my chest. You know, and do my own rock bar thing. Because that's really what was great about rock bar is all the you know scholarly work he did. You know, I just love his articles because you know people like to look back back at his articles now and judge certain things he said. But man, he was just getting it off his chest. Whatever it was, it was some somebody maybe pissed him off that day, and he just <laughs> went in, you know, just went in that day on his typewriter, you know, dropping twelve pages, and he put it out there, you know. Uh, yeah. He'd lay him out too, man. Lay him out. <laughs> and knock the was, fuck out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just reading uh, one of his uh, old posts he did on Malcolm X, you know, and uh, it was on, well, it was kind of on Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. Uh, but he rarely talked about Martin Luther King. He just didn't like Martin Luther King. I don't know what <laughs> I don't know what it was about MLK, but Rock Bar just didn't like him. He he kind of liked Malcolm X. He liked some things about him, but it's just funny just reading how he talked because I mean it was you know it wouldn't be allowed today. I mean it's a little anti PC, but I love it. You know. Yeah, well, maybe we can uh, bring up some of that Rock Bar stuff that you were reading uh, later on because I'll be curious to hear. It. I haven't I haven't uh, read what he had to say about those guys at all. That's good stuff. <laughs> So Robert, let's uh, let's have you do your uh, your thing here, where you talk about the plot of the movie, it's, um, Selma, and then we can start talking about some of the issues. All right, so this is my breakdown, my at least my plot plot synopsis. So Selma, directed by Ava DuVernay, um, came out in 2014, and it stars uh, David Oye Lowo as uh, Martin Luther King. And the movie starts with death threats, calls to the MLK homestead, and this is something that is repeated throughout the movie. They were constantly getting death threats from who knows who, but probably KKK and other people. Um, And not only death threats, but also they would get messages of recordings of supposed MLK infidelity to Floretta. But anyway, um, the movie kind of starts with the church bombing, where four young girls were murdered um, at the um, Birmingham, Alabama, 16th Street Baptist Church. Um, And then it goes to a scene where Oprah, I don't know the character she's playing, but she's trying to register to vote in, um, I assume, Selma, because she appears later in Selma. And the vote register guy is, like, being completely ridiculous about it. And he's saying... You know, she, she's filled out this document to the letter, and then he asks her to recite the preamble to the Constitution. And then when she does that, he asks her how many judges are in, like, Alabama court districts or something like that. And apparently her answer isn't good enough, and so he says, rejected. No, he, um, he says, and, uh, that, yeah, there's 68, but name them. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, so she gets the number right, and then he says, name them. So, you know, total dick move, right? Right. So um, then there's a scene with, um, I believe MLK is talking to LBJ, uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson, who's the current president at the time. And um, they start off by mentioning that they repealed the segregation laws because this is taking place after the Civil Rights Act. This is actually all about the um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Um, So they're talking about how they repeal the segregation laws, shouldn't you be happy? And MLK is like, no, this isn't good enough. We need this um, voting law. 
And LDJ is like, well, my actual deal is like this war on poverty. I'm really ramping it up. This is going to be sweet. This is going to be my deal. So kind of get in line sort of a thing. And King is like, oh, I'm sorry, that's not good enough. Um, so then Martin Luther King and his kind of group that he travels with, that they all kind of work together, they go to Selma. And he gets to town, and he like signs in to like, the, the hotel he's going to stay at or whatever. And like this guy comes up to him and says, can I introduce myself to you? And King's like, sure. And the guy just assaults him, just attacks him and punches him in the face. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed earlier in the film <clears throat> when they were first uh, showing Selma after his arrival, it says whites only and it has the hotel name. So he was trying to check into a hotel that was a whites only hotel. Oh, I didn't notice that. Okay. Um, so then there's a scene where the FBI chief um, is talking to LBJ and he offers to murder Martin Luther King to get him to go away permanently. Yeah, wink, wink, right? He actually did wink in the movie. Right, and Johnson's like, no, that's not going to be necessary. I want this guy, I want this nonviolent guy leading this. I don't want any of these militant people to do it, take over. Um, so then the next kind of big scene is King leading this protest in front of the courthouse where Oprah tried to register to vote. So he's leading this group, and they all go up, and there's um, these troopers and the sheriff standing in front of the courthouse, and there's all these people, and they sit down in front of the courthouse, and the sheriff is like, you need to clear out of here. And they're like, well, we're here to register to vote. And they're like, there's too many of you. And they're like, we, we'll, we'll wait. We can, we can get in there. It's fine. And so then they, um, the troopers kind of like start assaulting everybody. And they end up arresting a lot of people along with MLK. So then MLK is in, in the jail with a bunch of other people. Um, Malcolm X at this point shows up and he offers to help. He's like, I'll be the, 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 the option that um, they don't want. So then they'll go to you to be the, the option that they do want. Um, King is hesitant. He doesn't really like Malcolm X. He doesn't like his style. Um, so then we kind of move on to this night march. King had gone off to Los Angeles to do some fundraising, and there's this night march. And it's not clear whose idea this was, but he wasn't there. And the idea was to, I don't know, march in the middle of the night without light, with, with very few cameras. And the government actors kind of took this as a a good idea to beat some people up and to really intimidate people. So there's all the cops show up and they got all their billy clubs and they start assaulting everybody. And we follow a little family of three. Uh, there's an older man, a young man, and a young woman. And they try and hide out in a restaurant. And three troopers bust in and start assaulting them and then they murder the young man. Um, then... MLK comes back and he says, like, you know, there's no words to kind of comfort the, the man in his grieving of his dead son. Um, and we move on to MLK making this speech in front of this church congregation where he, it's, it's a strange speech, to, it was a strange speech for me to watch because on the one hand, he's saying very strange things where he says, everyone is guilty, it, that's not standing against this thing. And then he says that they want to take the power and vote the men responsible for the murder out of office. Um, then they move on to this march, where they're marching kind of from Selma to Birmingham. And King isn't there. I forget if King is in a jail or if he's just away. But... Um, there's all these people walking north, or walking from Selma to Birmingham, and they're crossing this bridge. And there's all these troopers lined up at the end of the side of the bridge. And they're saying, you know, you need to disperse. And one of the leader guys is like, let me talk to you. And they're like, no, there won't be any talking. And then they put gas masks on, and they start just assaulting everybody, and firing tear gas, and just brutalizing people for, you know, walking. Um, so then, um, there's a, like a, a news reporter 
who was kind of reporting what's happening, and he's saying that there were white people on the sidelines who were whooping and cheering as people were being assaulted. Um, then Martin Luther King comes back and talks to the press. Um, he says that all people bear a responsibility to their fellow man, that all men are created equal. Those are just some of the highlights that I noticed. But he's basically trying to drum up support for his cause. Um, then he himself leads another march to Montgomery. And this time, the troopers move aside. And then when they move aside, MLK turns around. And he claims that it could have been a trap. Um, so then later on, <laughs> I'm sorry, this is kind of rambling and whatever, but um, a bunch of people, like a bunch of people, he called. He made a call for action. And all these people came from around the, the, the country um, to then show their support. And while they're in town, um, this priest from Boston is murdered in the street. Um, so then they have this um, court battle to decide whether or not they're allowed to go on this protest, which kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, they wanted to get some judge's approval about whether or not they should be able to walk on this road or not. Um, and then at the end, they do end up going on this march. And then the movie ends with a speech at the end by Martin Luther King. And uh, I've got issues with a lot of it. And I feel mixed feelings. Um, the anarchist in me kind of recoils at a lot of the begging the state to treat them better. But at the same time, you know, it's hard to criticize somebody who was in the trenches at the time doing the best they could. So um, that's kind of my breakdown of the movie. Uh, but there, I've got a lot of points and different scenes to talk about. So, Daniel, if you want to go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, Ryan, do you, do you have any, anything to uh, start talking about at this point? Oh, well, I mean, it's, it's been probably a year since I saw the movie, so it's not super fresh in my mind. But uh, I, some things did stand out to me. The, the conversation with Malcolm X, that he had with uh, Coretta Scott and him, you know, before everything went down. I never, I never read anything about that. I don't know if that was true, if it really happened or not. But I just thought that was interesting because that during that time, that was when, you know, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King were viewed as kind of not enemies, but two opposite sides of the, you know, of the pole. You know, so I thought that kind of meeting was interesting. I don't know if it happened or not, but if it did, I just, I don't know, it's pretty interesting. And uh, you know, that tactic uh, Malcolm X takes where, hey, I'm going to scare them so much to where they'll come to you, you know. <laughs> I yeah. thought that's, that's pretty ill, you know, that's, that's sick. But sick in a good way, well, not good way, but just, you know, that's, that's just pretty tactical, you know. So Yeah, I remember, I remember there, was, there was some controversy um, on how historically accurate the film was or not, and uh, I don't, you know, like you were saying, I don't know if, if that conversation actually happened, but it is interesting in that uh, it's rather Hegelian where they're taking this uh, thesis antithesis and making a synthesis, you know, like they're saying, all right, Malcolm X is going to play bad cop and MLK can be the good cop. Uh, yeah. So he'll, he'll be so, you know, bitter a pill for them as well that they will come running to support MLK um, just so they can avoid having what Malcolm X represents, which is a more of a aggressive uh, resistance versus MLK's total nonviolence. Exactly. And, I mean, you could argue, you know, from a libertarian standpoint, you know, Malcolm X, was pro he wasn't a libertarian by any means, but he, Malcolm X probably was speaking our language more than uh, Martin Luther King. But I would definitely agree with that. Yeah, but he, he's, I mean, my mom would tell me stories. He, Malcolm X would scare, scare the heck out of people, you know. He's just, you know, I mean, he, they just didn't want to hear that type of stuff, you know. But he, really, he was just a nationalist, you know. We'd be here now a lot, but, you know, just like Farrakhan, but he was a very, very... Uh, great communicator, and he was a nationalist. He wanted black separation, you know. So, and that was that was just different to hear, especially from someone so confident in themselves, you know. So, I mean, it was interesting. The, just the dichotomy between those two was, was always fascinated me, and to see which one worked, you know. Obviously, Martin Luther King, his strategy worked better, you know. Even though both of them ended up dead by whoever, you know. Speaking of that, I don't know if you want to go on the side note, but. Do you guys think Martin Luther King was killed just by that random 
I don't even remember his name anymore. But just the one man shooter, or was it? Do you think there was something more to it? Yeah, the the, the conspiracy theorist in me and just the realist, I think, in me says there had to be something behind it. I mean, I forget the exact nature of the guy, but it was kind of some kind of career criminal guy who like didn't care if he went back to jail forever or not. Right. Um, yeah, I, I would be surprised if it was just some and lone we're, guy. We're talking about J. Edgar Hoover, you know? I mean, come on. And they had they had people watching King twenty four seven. So even if they even if it was like some guy, like they at least knew what was coming, you know. But you know, that's, it was always, it's always a lone nut, right? And uh, oh, Rothbard talks about it in one of his lectures. I'll try to find which one and post it below. But yeah, it's always like one crazy guy, and I I think that's just a tool of uh, you know, like in Zoolander, it's always they're always a, a model, right? Yeah, like right. Sirhan Sirhan when he killed Bobby Kennedy. I mean, he didn't even know what he was doing. Uh, yeah, JFK, all these, it's always a, a lone nut that's been played up or used in some way. It, there's no way it was just, just one guy that wanted to and do it, and so he did it. Uh, it's possible, but it's it's not probable. probable. But, you know, it's one of those things. We'll probably never, ever know the truth, just like, you know, JFK, but it's just something, you know. But, yeah, other than that, you know, with the movie, uh, I just thought, it, you know, it, it was a pretty good movie. You know, it didn't really, you know, flame any emotions like those movies typically do. But mm-hmm. it was uh, overall good, and I thought the director, uh, Ava, whatever. <laughs> right. <laughs> I thought the director, she did, she did a good job. You know, she tried to include everything she could. You know, obviously she probably took some, you know, some liberations with the storytelling, but, you know, she included the, right. the bombing, you know, the terrorist attack, that you want to call it, you know, the church, you mm-hmm. know, which, I mean, literally, that's a terrorist attack in my opinion. That was, you know, this, 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 that's crazy. But, you know, all that, just imagine all that going on at that time. You know, I mean, the tension, the, I mean, that, that, that would just, I just can't imagine it now. Well, I mean, I can't imagine it now because, you know, we do pretty much have that. But Well, there know, was all that, especially with all the, um, I mean, just another point to say that it was probably some kind of conspiracy to kill him. I know there was a lot of, um, wasn't it MLK who was saying, and they were afraid of him saying that, um, you know, to tell all the, pe- all the black people not to go fight in Vietnam? Yeah, that was, that was later, yeah, later before he died, about 67. He became, you know, very, he, you know, he became very outspoken against, you know, foreign policy and the war, in, the war in, in in Vietnam. He became very, he, I mean, he sounded like a libertarian. He was like, bring them back home. We don't need to be over there, period. Not just black, but everybody, Americans. We don't need to be over there. And that, I think that really set the fuel. I think, I think the government was okay with him with the kind of racial unrest type of thing. But you start mm-hmm. talking against the military industrial contract. Right, complex, right. They can't have that. that. Oh, no, <laughs> no, we got to shut this guy up, you know. Yeah, I mean that's what happened to Muhammad Ali, right? He was like, I got no quarrel with, with the Vietnamese, and they uh, stripped his title, put him in jail, right? Shut him down. Like, can you imagine that happening today? Like, yeah. I think of like the most popular athlete. I don't know, LeBron James. You know, imagine them kicking him out the NBA, stripping his rings. I mean, that would just be unheard of. But like, it happened in America. You know. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy stuff. And over the, the over not over race, but over the you know the military, the foreign policy. Yeah, you but know, I think these these days it wouldn't be the government; it would be uh, the leftists, like trying to get them to get torn down, right? Because because right. he violated their their safe space and didn't say something that was politically correct or something. Good observation. It's pretty much the same thing, you know. They do it they do it without the you know the violence of the state, but they pretty much it's almost like the state, you know, where it's just this mob rule that just shuts you down and you can't even get up, you know. But yeah. uh, as far as the rest of the movie, I enjoyed it. They included a lot. They included the, uh, the two white, the, the white liberal people that came down to march that eventually got killed. You know, you don't hear about much about them, like in history books. They were like these, uh, like liberal socialists. You know, that marched with uh, Martin Luther King. You know, when I, when I, you know, I just think of Bernie Sanders. <laughs> when I think of that, I'm like, I bet Bernie Sanders was one of those types. You know, this is out there marching with uh, Martin, with, marching with Martin Luther King. You know. They eventually got killed by the KKK, one of which, of course, was a FBI informant, you know, and they tried to make, they tried to slander the uh, the female, to make her look like she was hanging around with Negroes, and they tried to put, like, uh, uh, syringe marks on her, on her arm to make it look like she was, like, a drug addict or something, but come to find out that was just dirty tricks by the FBI, so, I mean, it was like they had something to do with killing her, you know, so... Mm. Yeah, this, this is just crazy. The times when you think about it, you know, and, and I'm sure time we like to think times have changed. Maybe the intentions have changed, but the the tactics they took, I'm sure they still use. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's almost too bad that uh, Bernie wasn't down there, right? <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> hey, man, we wanted some controversy on this show. Uh, I'm sorry, man. Bernie gets it right like one out of 100 times. Yeah, he'll say something true, and then, and then he'll, yeah. And he'll <laughs> completely, completely blow it away. Like or... Five seconds later, he just really shits on it, you know. Yeah, he'll have the bass yeah. backwards response to it. Hey, you know, it's funny. Um, I knew I wanted to do this movie for a show for MLK but for this holiday, but I hadn't seen it yet until a couple of days ago, and I was dreading watching it because I, I had this total expectation that it was going to be this SJW socialist tinge to it, and I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, it was actually a very uh, well-done movie, but not too strong of, of that message I was expecting. Um, though, to your point, Ryan, I, I, I do agree. I think that there, it was a movie that just kind of happened, and it didn't draw on a lot of emotions, which was a little bit strange because it was a very um, emotional story that they were telling and I felt like they didn't really I feel like after watching that movie and it's two hours you, I expect to um, have you know the main character MLK get developed a bit and um, he's in it a lot but I don't know if I learned a whole lot about him from it exactly. yeah I didn't I didn't feel any strong emotion from it at all you know I was just like oh like it was just basically a good historical documentary that yeah that's how I would look at it like you know, wow that happened you know and they moved on but yeah, I, I thought, I mean, the guy did a good job as MLK, but I didn't feel like, you know, I, I guess they just didn't deliver the, I guess, the emotional impact I was expecting. You know, I mean, because they haven't been, you know, to say MLK is like this huge figure, there really hadn't been like a lot of MLK movies, you know. Like I didn't, like mm-hmm. Malcolm X movies by Spike Lee is like one of my favorite like, top 20 movies of all time. Like it, anytime it's on, I watch it, you know. I didn't get that impact from this movie. Yeah, I haven't seen that movie since it came out, and I remember and it's super long, right? It's like three hours or something. But oh, yeah, it's long as hell. I remember being pretty impacted by it, and I think that came out when I was in high school. Um, but, yeah, the only MLK experience I had was, you know, what you see in the media, and uh, I think I read a book about him in third grade, <laughs> you know? And um, uh, one thing I did see in recent years was, um, you know, Steph Molyneux, he does a lot of uh, the truth about, and, uh, you know, whatever subject or whoever. And he did one on MLK, and um, in the movie, they talk about how the government was trying to paint him uh, with a socialist brush um, to discredit him. And uh, I think that Steph talks about a lot of the uh, Communist Party socialist tinge to some of the things he was saying. And I don't, I don't know if um, I know enough about it to really say much, uh, but did, do you, either one of you guys see any of that in, in what he talks about? I mean, his idea of... Um, you know, equality based on the content of your character, I'm all with that. That's totally fine. Uh, I support that entirely. But uh, do you think that there is was any egalitarianism in what he was talking about? Uh, I mean, want me to go? Uh, sure, you go first. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Definitely there was egalitarianism. There was, uh, I mean, one of his main uh, mentors were, was uh, Gandhi, you know. And, I mean, especially if you look at the history of socialism in America, you know, you know, post World War War World, World War One. You know, a lot of the you know the Jewish folks started immigrating to America. A lot of times, they would end up in the black sections of cities. You know, and these people they talked to you know they talked to each other. And a lot of these you know Jewish folks that came over, they were you know they were socialists, they were communists. You know, and they you know there was a there was a movement. If you look if you look up Trotsky and what he wanted to do, he wanted to tap into that you know that uh, that inequality into that rage that was building within, you know, the black community with the whole civil rights and with the uh, the Jim Crow, with all the things that were going on. He wanted to tap into that. He didn't know how. He couldn't really figure out how, but they did. And they were, they were on the college campuses just like today, you know. A lot of the socialists that are around today, like uh, Betty Wright, you know, they came up in the 50s going to Berkeley, you know, and having their, their uh, professors, you know, socialists, talking them about Cuba and how great Cuba is and how great – the Soviet Union is and all that stuff that, you know, the, the socialists are all about equality and welcome them everybody. And America is a great evil empire that wants to stump you down, these capitalist pigs. And, you know, this fed into the anger, you know. So, I mean, a lot of it is rooted in some social. I don't know if MLK was a socialist. He hung, he hung around with many. You know, he hung around. That's what kind of put him on the radar of J. Edgar Hoover. He was hanging around with all these Communist Party people and stuff like that. So <clears throat> that, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that, some of his motivations came from that, but if you look at what he was saying, you know, he really wasn't 
he wasn't that extreme. He was just more, you know, hey, we all we're all the same deep down. And you know, he did you know towards the end of his uh, before he died, he did kind of get more radical on the uh, economic end. But there's some believe that he was kind of pushed. That was kind of like a trade off with LBJ. He was like, you know, okay, I'm going to be against the war, but I'm going to help you out on this war on poverty thing, you know. So he started preaching more about equality, economic equality and, you know, redistribution of income and stuff like that. So a lot of people like to say that's why he was eventually assassinated, you know, because he was becoming he was becoming woke. You know, he was becoming more of a true socialist instead of this kind of, a, you know, of a half measure. Oh, yeah. It's interesting you use that term woke because that seems to be a, a present-day term that a lot of um, folks will use who are, I don't know, I'd categorize them as like urban uh, white hipsters, you know, to, to be like sensitive to um, racial issues or transgender issues or whatever they consider themselves woke. And isn't it one of the things that was sort of attacked in that MTV uh, Hey White Guys video, um, New Year's Resolutions? I think you just watched it recently, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, tell yeah, us well, a little bit about that. No, it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I just, yeah, I just watched it. I remember when it came out and I was just like, I just saw what it was about. Like, dear white people on MTV, I didn't even have to see it to know what they were going to say. I was just like, oh, this is stupid. Right. But uh, then I watched it today, and it, I just, it's just so stupid, man. I mean, what, what are you supposed to say? You know, I mean, I can't, I'm not, I'm not a white guy, so I don't know how it feels, but I can imagine how it feels. It's like, Jesus, like, leave me alone, you know? <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, it's so stupid. I and mean, they talk about woke. You know, woke was, especially around the time of, like, Trayvon Martin and, you know, kind of the early days of Black Lives Matter, you know, it was always about stay woke. You know, they would post something about, you know, African history or, you know, you know what's going on in the world, black people, and stay woke. That's the hashtag, stay woke. You know, that kind of became that kind of a thing, and I guess it kind of migrated to the, you know, the you know the suburban white hipsters. You know, <laughs> so they're like, whoa, I'm woke, you know. So I don't know, it's, funny. I, I, it's just funny they included that. They try to make it funny, but I just thought that you know, TV thing was just dumb. Like, it it was. It actually looked like something like uh, uh, Julie Borowski or something like that. Like she'll make to make fun of SJWs. You know, like that's how stupid it looked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Julie, Julie's great, but yeah, she's yeah. she sometimes wears a like crazy costume and does weird stuff. I think she actually did a response to this. Uh, uh, so did uh, Mr. Dapperton. He used to be known as Anarchy Ball. And oh. I think his point was, well, what if we made it about black people or Mexican people? You know, it would be like totally outrageous, and you'd get shut yeah. down completely. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's I'm not even arguable. See, you know, a lot of people like to make those points. Tom Woods, everybody. What if we did this about blacks? Or what if we did this about Muslims or something? And, I mean, it's not even a question. You know, I mean, it's, <laughs> you got to understand you're viewed as the master race, the the top dog. So, you know, we can make fun of the top dog, but the top dog cannot make fun of us. You know, it's like the prettiest girl in school making fun of the the fat ugly girl. You know. So, nobody, Brian, are you nobody, saying, there? There is. There's a truth, a nugget of truth to the um, only white people can be racist thing. No, no, I'm not saying there's truth to it, but I'm just saying that 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 you could. I'm not, I'm not even going to say you can understand where they're coming from, but that's where they're coming from with it. Like that's right. That's the area they're coming from. Like if you're the prettiest girl in school, you can't talk about the ugly, fat, ugly girl. You know, you'd be like, oh, you're, you're just mean. But if the fat, ugly girl does a nice riff on a pretty girl, it's like, oh, go ahead, go ahead, girl, you got yours in. You know, you. You're just standing up for yourself, you know, which I find kind of condescending. You know, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I just, I don't, I don't like that either way. You know, you gotta, you know, it, there, especially when you look at it on a bigger picture. We, we're all just people, like we're all just individuals trying to make you, you know, you're living your life, I'm living mine. There's no real, there's no real grading level to, you know, who's winning, you know, and who's not, you know. So that's that's right. obviously a construct that they came up with. You know, but that's that's where they come from. It that's that's the way they're coming at it. It's like, oh, you guys have all the power, so we could we could say what we want. You know, you're you can't be racist. You know, we can't be racist. You know, because you have all the power. You're the riches. You're the you know, you have everything. You know, so yeah, and that whole uh, that power argument seems to be very socialist in my mind, um, because it's this nebulous thing, right? It's like uh, what power in in what respect? Um, yeah, and not to mention the fact you're lumping all. All white people together as some right. sort of giant group. When <laughs> we're all individuals, like you said. I mean, these yeah. were the same people. I mean, these same people probably 20 years ago were saying, "Oh, don't generalize. You shouldn't generalize." Now they're just making these huge generalizations. I mean, you could just be. I mean, if, if you're just a middle class white guy 
Not even that. If you're a working poor white guy, you're still like this privileged guy that just has everything handed to him. Or yeah, even or even a, a, a unemployed novel writing white guy with two percent of propane, which Robert is right now. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Super privileged. You're privileged, man. You're privileged. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Sorry I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. Let me tell you. I'm ready to break it to you, buddy. <laughs> uh, so, hey, before we get off this uh, MTV thing real quick, um, one of the other arguments that they presented was that uh, saying you have a black friend doesn't mean anything or isn't good enough or something along those lines. And yeah. I take issue with that because um, I think that by default, if you have black friends and you aren't racist against black people, I mean, you are judging people by the content of your character, but Ryan, you're going to tear me apart on this one. Uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, Dylan Roof, his good friend was a black guy. You can look him up on YouTube. Like the, the, the media were interviewing him, and they were like, yeah, we talked the day before, before he went and walked into a church and killed eight people because they were black. You know, that, I think, like for me, I have, a, I have a low grading level for, I mean, a high grading level for racism. You know, you have to really prove you're a racist for me to call you racist. I think that that's pretty racist. You know? Let's go find this black church and shoot everybody in there while they're praying. You know, so yeah, you could be racist and have you know a black friend, but and it also goes back to what you define racism as. You know, they define racism as, I mean, saying yeah, I don't think affirmative action is a good policy. Like that's racist to them. You know, so <laughs> so they have a pretty low bar of defining racism. You know, so. Yeah, you could you could have, but me personally, I mean, I think it's limited. I think if you're truly a racist, I mean, I mean, you had white people in the South, you know, way back, you know, they had black friends, you know, they, I mean, their slaves were good friends to them, you know, they were like, hey, that's my boy, you know, I, I take care of him every day, but that's his slave, you know, there's still a level of racism in that, but I mean, it's all, I guess, in how much you want to break it down, you know. But I, like I said, I don't. I can't sit and judge anybody. You gotta, you have to look at the context of what they're saying and how they're living before you judge them as racist. And personally, I just, I just don't have time to sit here and judge people. Are they racist? Are they racist or not? I just don't have the time or the mental energy to like think about that stuff. You know, I used to when I was younger, when I was brought up on those type of thoughts. Like, oh, I bet that guy's racist. You know, Cause I remember uh, I was trying to, I was working at the hospital, and I was trying to uh, move up. You know, in advance, you know, move up in advancement into the in the, to the IT department. Mm -hmm. And one of the guys that worked in the IT department, he was a black guy. He was like, "Oh yeah, they're racist up there. You know, you, you good luck trying to get up there. It's full of racism. You know." And I believed him. I was like, "Oh, okay, that's why they're not answering my application." And I told my sister about it because she has, a, you know, she was pretty high up in the you know in the organization, and she was like, "Just stop it. You know, it's no racism." <laughs> you know, she said, "You keep doing your work." You finish school, you know, somebody's going to give you a call. Maybe not us, but somebody. It's nothing to do with racism. You know, and she kind of slapped me in the face and kind of got me right, you know. Yeah, I mean, the economic argument is if you can do the job and if there was racism, then your wages would have been depressed in contrast to somebody who wasn't. So you would have made them more profit by fulfilling the same level of work. You know, so there's a free market incentive to get the best person regardless of race or whatever else. I mean, the best person who can do the job, male, female, White, black, alien, you know, three legs, five arms, whatever, it doesn't matter. And this happened, you know, this happened in history. You know, people, you know, businessmen tried to hire black people, you know, but then there will be this, you know, the unions will come out against hiring blacks or, they, you know, they'll partner up and try to get some politician to inspire some kind of anger or they'll use some kind of dirty tricks. They always go back to, you know, black men are raping, trying to rape white women. They always, you know, they will bring up all these fears. You know, and then to try to, you know, to tamp it down, you know. But, it's the, the, you know, these black socialists, you know, and these, you know, these Marxists today, they, well, for the last 50 years, they like to paint capitalism as this uh, as an institution of racism, which is like the complete opposite. It's like the furthest you can get away from racism is capitalism, in my opinion, anyway. Absolutely. Yeah, though it's certainly in true capitalism, voluntary situations, it certainly allows for racism to occur. Like right. you should be free to associate or not associate with people on any reason, you know, any any choice that you make. Um, yeah. And but if, that's not racism to me. You'll just suffer like a market disadvantage because of it. Yeah, but you know, association, you know, choosing who you associate with isn't necessarily racist to me. You know, I mean, it might be prejudice, depending on you know the reasons. You know, if you think, you know, all white people are evil, or all black people are evil, you know, so you just choose to stay away from them. 
You know, that, yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of racist, but that's just more prejudice to me. Like, I don't care. I don't, those people don't bother me. Like, they don't, they don't want to be around me. Why would, I not, why would I want to be around them? They're doing me a favor by staying away from me. But it's once they start trying to use the state. You know, speaking of that, you guys brought a great point. I think it was on the Star Trek episode where you said voting, I don't know how you said it, but voting kind of socializes the violence. You know, it spreads it out. It lowers the cause of violence. Yep. So while, you know, in a free society, you might have a black neighbor, some black guy moves in your neighborhood, and you don't like black people, you know. For you to get that black person out of there, you're going to have to implement some, you know, pretty expensive resources. You're going to have to get a crew together to run them away. You're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to put your life at risk to run somebody right. out of a neighborhood, you know. But, hey, but with the government at hand, all you got to do is go cast a vote. You know, all you got to do is send 100 bucks to a politician and call them every day, you know, to get them on your side, you know. So, uh, that, I mean, to me, so when it comes down to a racism, I think it was Malcolm X, that, I mean, uh, Martin Luther King that said it, you know, prejudice plus power is racism, you know, and I look at power as the state. You know, so if, you, if you're prejudiced and you have the state on your side, that's true racism, you know. But you remove the state out of it, it gets some prejudiced people. That's just going to that's just a part of the earth. You know, maybe we can move past it one day. You know, we haven't yet. But I could deal with that as long as I have my freedom to, you know, trade and associate with who I want to and, you know, live my life. Yeah, it's funny how in the in the film Sama, they're sort of um, begging the state to, you know, grant them the right to vote, and it's sort of the state that's been oppressing them. And I guess from a leftist perspective, you'd be they would be arguing that they're good actors and bad actors within the state. So some of them, you know, like Governor Wallace and and the uh, the head of the police troopers and the sheriff were, you know, bad agents of the state. But LBJ was, you know neutral to good, and a couple of the other folks were, were good or protagonists within the film. So they would probably lay the argument out that, well, the state is a uh, representation of the will of the people, and because the will of the people only allowed white people to vote, therefore the will was racist, and the government was therefore racist. So if we just get the right people in power and we uh, allow black people to vote, then that will solve the problem. Uh, it sort of rubbed me the wrong way because you know here they are begging their masters, if you will, for some privilege that, you know, in my mind is actually a, uh, an aggression against others voting. Um, and I don't know, it, it just seemed like, I, I almost, like you were saying earlier, Malcolm X was more of the libertarian in that he wouldn't stand for that shit. <laughs> and he, would, he just wanted to, like, separate, which is, you know, people, lefties, like, shriek and cry about it, like Brexit and that sort of thing. But yeah. freedom of association is inherent to all people. And if you don't want to hang out with somebody and if groups want to get together and not hang out with other groups, you should be perfectly free to do that. So, yeah, it, I'm all for it. Any kind of increasing compartmentalization or complete, you know, people want to separate and go about and do their own thing, make their own groups. That doesn't hurt yeah. me at all. Yeah, and I mean, I understand where, you know, in the civil rights movement where they were coming from because, like you said, voting is sort of an aggressive act, although a very minimal one, a very minimal aggressive act. You know, collectively it's a very harsh aggressive act, you know, but that right. aggressive act has been taken taken place against you know blacks at that time, so obviously they would say, hey, you know, we, let's use this to our advantage. Let's try to you know at least even the scale a bit. And if you, I don't know who gave this lecture, but it was on the Liberty Classroom, Tom Woods Liberty Classroom. Uh, <clears throat> you know, he said the lecturer said the most changes came after the Voting Rights Act because before the Voting Rights Act, they had already passed legislation to. Uh, for uh, public accommodations, I believe, you know, so businesses couldn't no, no longer do, you know, colors only, I believe, you know. I don't know if that was before or afterward, but I think he said after the Voting Rights Act was passed, that's when all the changes really happened because people, were, I guess, you know, people really got scared, like, wow, you know, you know, the scales have been kind, scales have been kind of even now, you know. But like you said, I mean, voting is just a, another form of violence, you know. That's all it is at the end of the day, you know, so. I don't know. I, I, for me, from a historical perspective, I can't say I dislike it because obviously I've had some benefits from that. You know, I don't. You know, I could walk wherever I want. I don't have to deal with sun, sundown towns like they used to have all over America, where if you you're black and you're out at night after seven o'clock, you know, you can get your ass beat, you can get killed, you can get put in prison just for being out. You know, there was a curfew. You know, we had to black people had to buy this guide like this traveling guide, there's a special traveling guide where to avoid, like don't go to this town, don't go to, don't take this road. 
It was somebody put together a guide that lets you travel all over America so you can avoid these sundown towns and these aggressive towns where black people just happen to disappear, you know. So they look at the free market at work, you know. <laughs> yeah, free market response to that. Yeah, but, you know, so, I mean, it was just a crazy time. So I kind of, I don't say I excuse them, but you kind of can understand where they were coming from at that time. But at the same time, I completely agree. You're going to your masters to beg you. You pretty much beg them to just oppress us a little less right. or oppress them more so we can mm-hmm. get even. You know, it's just, at the end of the day, just overthrow your oppressor or don't acknowledge him as an authority anymore. Say, hey, you're no longer my authority. You know, and look, some black black people tried that going back to the 1800s. Uh, there's a guy, I don't remember his name, but he tried to, you know, get like a movement of all these black people from the slave states to move to Kansas and form their own little own little city or state, you know, but it just didn't get traction because you've always had liberals and people that kind of wanted to push this whole, let's all live together in this egalitarian society, which, I mean, just from you, you know, from a human standpoint, just has never really been natural to come about. Well, I won't say it hadn't been natural. It just hadn't come about yet. You know? mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's fairly tribal. Nothing. Right. But yeah, People it has to be right. It is what it is. You know, it's nothing racist or bad about that. It just becomes racist once you institute the state to start committing violence for you. I always like what uh, Walter Williams said. He said, uh, if they had to pass a law for it, that, meant, that means people already wanted to do it. You mm-hmm. know, just like in the 1600s, there were, you know, the blacks that did get free from slavery for whatever reason, the free people of color, you know, sometimes they would date white people and get married to white people. For some people, that was appalling. So they passed these laws to ban interracial marriage, you know. They, the state came in after the fact to, to put down a law to prevent people, free people, from doing what they want to do. Yeah, that's you know, where so marriage licenses there. came from. Exactly. So that's, it's always the state that comes in after the fact to prevent people from making associations, associations that they wanted to, you know. And that's not to say that there weren't free people committing violence, but you could, you know, put them in jail, you know. <laughs> if, you know, if white people are burning down, you know, black neighborhoods, put them in jail. If vice versa, put them in jail, you know. But don't, you know, it's only the state comes in and, you know, it's choosy at how they react, you know, how they uh, put their violence into play. Yeah. Right. And, and, and yeah, and the government provides such a terrible service. I mean, if you're talking about how the government is essentially a company that's supposed to provide laws and order and whatever service to a certain geographical area, that all the laws you scribble down on pieces of paper are supposed to apply equally to all, and then they don't actually do that, you're, you know, you're providing a bad service. And from the libertarian perspective, well, since they have no competition, of course they're going to provide the, just the worst, shittiest service. Right. They have little market incentive to provide a good service. And uh, Martin Luther King, you know, he made it such a big issue that essentially he had to force and basically grant, basically give any prospective action a lot of political capital to achieve what he was trying to get done. If I could, if I'm making sense here, um, no, I see what you're saying. He's given them. He's given. He had to make it such an issue to grant these government politicians enough political capital to take it on. Um, so in that sense, he was quite, it was quite clever. I mean, he, what he did, I think, was, I mean, for, to, ach- to achieve his goal, to get, to get government to actually do their jobs as they claim that they have the right to do, um, it was actually quite well done. Um, yeah. and there are, I don't know if we want to get into this, but because um, it's kind of like Monday morning, morning, Monday morning quarterbacking style, but did you have any issue with, how MLK kind of wanted violence to happen. He wanted his protesters to get attacked by the cops. Like there's a scene on the bridge where he goes and he's on the march to Montgomery and then the cops kind of go away. And then so he turns them all around. And it seemed to be that he he later said that, well, there was probably going to be a trap. But it seemed to me that he needed there to be violence because he wanted there to be a lot of attention on it. He wanted, you know, in order to be an oppressed person, you need to have an oppressor. Um, but in order to achieve his goal, he was willing to, like, sacrifice some pawns, so to speak. Do you have any kind of issues with that, either of you? Kind of like a Machiavellian ends justify the means kind of a thing. Um, I 
generally think of MLK as a good dude, but it seems kind of a strange, like a general will sacrifice, you know, he'll make a feint with like 500 troops knowing that they're going to die in order to win the battle. Anyone want to jump in on this one? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, from what I've read, that was, you know, that was the truth. I don't know if if it was like, you know, a strategic thing or, you know, just a spur of the moment. Hey, you know, let me just get the best out of this situation. But yeah. yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, that, there was some truth to that. He wanted, he knew if he could show that the civil rights group, his his group, the, uh, the SPLNC, showing that they are nonviolent, they are not the ones aggressing, right? and show the other people, hey, these are the aggressors. We're the ones being beat, beat down in the street. That would reach out to the, just the normal middle class white voters out there and, you know, all around America, the ones up north, the ones out west. You know, that would hit home with them. That would, you know, that would you know, great, great sympathy, you know. And that sympathy, you know, sympathy turns out votes, you know, works. You right. know, so he was strategic. He was a very smart man. He was strategic in looking at the long view. And he was very, people criticized him for it, but he, he was a uh, incrementalist. You know, he had no, you know, a lot of people, a lot of, like, they showed the, uh, the student groups that he was with, you know, that was behind them, like right. all these little college student groups. They wanted it now. They wanted everything they wanted. They wanted it right now. He was like, hold on, you know, we have to do this smart, get a piece at a time, you know, we can't win the whole war, it's going to be battles. So that's how he looked at it. He, he, and that's how the left is today. They still take it today, like, you know, incrementalism. You know, I always say, like, the left, if, if you, you hate them for what they want, they're great at getting what they want in small pieces and being happy with it, you know. Like, if, even if it's just Obamacare. Like, that's, like, how can you call yourself a socialist and like Obamacare? Like, it's a ter- even from a socialist standpoint, it's a terrible law, you know, but you know, hey, it's the best we could do now, and eventually, hey, maybe we'll get single parent, single parent health care. You know, you know, where us libertarians, we like, you know, screw that, you know, destroy the state, burn it all down. You know, uh-huh. <laughs> but but I, I mean, myself, I just can't, I can't. It's hard for me to talk myself into being like an incrementalist like that. You know, but I mean, uh, liberals have no principle at all, so I don't think it's too hard for them. You know. So. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if there's a lesson that we as libertarians can take from this. I mean, not not the whole begging from the state, but like that that longer view uh, where you're strategi- strategically, because I mean, they obviously could have um, defended themselves, but they would have been overwhelmed, right? So yeah. sometimes self-defense isn't the best uh, option, the course of action. Yeah, I mean, think about it. If MLK brought guys with guns out there and they started shooting at the cops, I mean, it's it's over. You know, they, they, we wouldn't even be talking about the civil rights movement, right? It'll be like the civil rights terrorist group. You know, it, yeah. you know, it'll, it'll be completely different on how we look at history. So, you know, I mean, you could say what he did was right or wrong, but I mean, it, it worked. You know, so yeah, there was there was a scene uh, early on where um, where MLK had taken that very strategic path and said, "Hey, we can concentrate just on this uh, courthouse where we're going to um, try to all register to vote. It's very concentrated, and we can get a lot of press coverage on it." But when uh, Sheriff Clark goes into the crowd and, and starts pushing that old man who can't kneel down or whatever that you know they want him to do or get out of the way. The Oprah character, um, she hits the hits the sheriff. And yeah, I was wondering right. if if you guys thought she was justified in doing so and I think definitely she's coming to the aid of another. Um, but it it is a contrast to the uh, MLK approach of nonviolence because like even though she had the right, the moral right to defend another and defend herself, um, right. strategically it wasn't going to get her anywhere other than beat up and in jail. You know, this is why I always say the state loves MLK. That's why we have a MLK Day. That's why I don't care if you're Republican, but even though Republicans came out against the MLK Day for the most part back in the day, I mean, a lot of them at least, just on a local level. But, I mean, over time, MLK has been that darling, you know, because they love the nonviolent approach to, you know, to protesting and not recognizing authority. They like that approach. They could deal with that. We can take the, you know, we can give you a little crumb here and a little crumb there to keep you satisfied. They right. don't want the Malcolm X, the Black Panther, the, they don't want to deal with that because that's blood in the streets. You know, that's, that doesn't look good. For government. Because, I mean, when you think about it, as strong as government is, we love to talk about the power of the state. It is very powerful. It is. But, I mean, if you watch, like, the, uh, the riots in Baltimore, like, they pretty much took over the, half the city. I'm talking about, like, 300 people over half the city. I mean, the, the police department were they were they were out. They were done. They didn't know what to do. So when you think about it, like if they want, if, if you know the American people wanted to start a revolution, it wouldn't take many. You know, 
Because well, don't get me wrong, the government has a lot of weapons and a lot of guns that could blow people away. But if just enough rolls up, you know, that scares the hell out of the state. You know, that's why they would rather pass some laws, spread some money around, you know, just to keep you peace, just to keep you at ease, give you some crumbs, so you're not going hungry. You know, that's why they they rather take that approach to ruling rather than using the heavy hammer. You know, that's, that's, once you come, yeah, once you come down with the hammer, that really incites and a, a rebel, you know, a rebel group that will, you know, try to take you down, you know. So that was kind yeah, of a king, the king's whole strategy. Hmm? Yeah, show them, show them for, for the thugs that they are. That was kind of king's strategy, right, to get it in the news and, and make it just yeah. so obvious and apparent. Um, though I want to contrast a little bit, Ryan, with what you're saying, because um, I think in a lot of more recent protests and riots that have occurred that there have been um, instigators, like implanted uh, instigators who try to start shit, and, and I think it's been argued that uh, they're... Ob- um, government agents, like provocateurs. Colin Telpro is absolutely a real thing. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I don't know if they're government or if they're, they're like, Soros agents, <laughs> you know. <laughs> same, I don't know. same thing. Same thing, you know, I mean, I don't know, but, I mean, I, I've seen it. I know people that were out there in Baton Rouge during the whole protest, you know, and it's it always starts out with just normal people from the neighborhood, you know, just coming out and trying to vent their, you know, vent their, uh, vent their spirits out, you know. But then after a day or two, you know, once it gets online, you have all these little groups, all these little political action groups that get money from Soros and all these different places. They come down and, they, you know, D-Ray, he was down here. Everybody was down here. Then it becomes this big media scene. You know, and I always laugh at, do you, do you guys know who D-Ray is, the Black Lives Matter guy? Mm, D-Ray no, I don't Nicholson? Know. Is, he, is he the guy who uh, said he got hit by the car at the, uh, in St. Louis or whatever? I don't know. But he's the guy, he, he, he him and Sean... Sean King, they always used to kind of tweet together, and, and he's a black guy. He, you know, he's part of Black Lives Matter. But anyway, he was down here, and there's a picture of him being arrested. And I mean, it's like straight out of a magazine. He's like standing there, sweaty, looking dead into the camera. You know, he's skinny. You know, and he has his, like he looks like a model. You know, and he's being arrested by these big SWAT, you know, SWAT police. And it's just it's the perfect picture of state versus man. You know, mm. but he was he was just using the same old Martin Luther King tactic of Hey, let me try to engender some kind of sympathy to show, hey, we're being, we're, we're the weak being, you know, beat down by the masters, you know. Which on some level I like, but on another level, I don't like their, I, I know what they're trying to do, and I don't like where this headed, you know. Yeah, well, that was the Gandhi thing, right? Like uh, some of the, what was it, the salt march that they did, where they just walked into all the British, just beating the crap out of them, and they just kept walking into it. Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, so it's it's kind of interesting because, like, King had been through a couple of, uh, in Selma anyway, they talk about how he'd been in Albany or somewhere up in New York and then another um, another city where they're dealing with different types of sheriffs or police officers who either made mistakes or didn't. And so it, it made him conceive of this strategy to, like, concentrate their efforts in one area and uh, deal with the police, um, you know, antagonist who would definitely overreact and, and become the bully, uh, which, you know, I'd argue from a libertarian and anarcho- narco capitalist perspective, they're all always bullies uh, no matter right. what. Uh, yeah. But obviously he would become more of an aggressive bully. And uh, I don't know, I, not, not to go sideways on this too much, but I kind of felt like, um, you know, the whole time I was watching this movie, I'm like, well, isn't government the problem? And, and here he is, like, trying to get government to, like, be the solution. And it just seemed kind of weird to me. That's been my whole great like literally for years. I was like, why are we why are we asking them for salvation? You know, would the slave go to his master and beg him you know, be nicer to me, you know? Maybe they maybe they would, you know, but to me it would be more like, you know, I have to set myself free. You know, I have to take my life into my own hands and figure out a way to free myself, you know, from this bondage. You know? Right, because when you beg your master you're just legitimizing the fact that they think that they're they're your master. I mean Thank you should you. just be you have no authority over me. I'm walking away from you. Right. And if you come at me, I'm taking you down. <laughs> I mean, it's easier said than done. I understand that. But right. and I, I wish you, just, you just hit the point on it. I mean, it's easier said than done. So I guess at, one, at some level, they're taking the easiest, you know, the easiest route to what they're trying to get, you know. But right. Even, even that's not really easy, but it's easier than just, you know, say getting a gun and saying, okay, I no longer recognize your authority, Mr. Sheriff. And he would blow you away. 
Yeah, and that's that's like the Oprah character hitting back, right? Like yeah. it's not a strategic decision. Um, the second march that they did, where the troopers all stood aside because there were enough people there. That that's when the rabbis were there, and the priests were there, and a bunch of white people and black people. Like the the group was much bigger than the first attempted march across the bridge, and it reminded me of um, Larkin Rose and his YouTube video, The Tiny Dot, because it really showed how many more of us there are than there are of government agents. So like to your point earlier, Ryan, you were saying that they're scared to shitless of uh, MLK types, or sorry, um, Malcolm X types or Black Panther types, like actually resisting uh, and, and becoming a large enough, yet still small um, in relation to the entire population, but a large enough group to actually resist um, how small in relation the government actually is to the overall population. Exactly my point, you know. I mean, that's why I've always argued when people, you know, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter folks talk to me, hey, you know, what should we do? What should we do? You know, because I always be like, you know, man, you're just legitimizing the state. You know, what? I'm always asking, them, what are your goals? Like, what's your long-term goal? This Black Lives Matter thing, because they can't give me an answer. They be like, oh, we just want freedom from the police. We don't want to be killed anymore. I'm like, okay, that's, you're not telling me anything, you know. And I always suggest, what if your neighborhood, say it's a, you know, it's a majority black neighborhood, but if all you guys come together. You know, you could use the state apparatus if you want. You could say, hey, we're going to come together and we're going to sign these petitions to say we are going to separate. We're going to become our own town. We no longer recognize this, this district police force or this parish or county police force as our authority. We no longer accept it. We're going to form our own. You know, and I don't know if there's some kind of legal method you go through for that, some kind of like city nullification or city secession. I don't know if it's possible. Maybe you form your own state. I don't know. But why not take that route instead of, just standing in the street, screaming through a bullhorn until somebody beats on you and you can get on camera and then tweet about it. You know, I mean, what, 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 you know, what, are, the rules, what are we trying to do here? You know? Yeah, Ryan, I'll say, if, if you do start that uh, sovereign uh, area, I will move there. <laughs> you sure? <laughs> no, I mean, I'm serious, though. I mean, if that's what you really want. If you're, if, if you're literally legitimately sick of police occupying your neighborhood, your your territory, kick them out, you know, kick them out. They were police, you know, they are, I mean, I won't say they're underfunded, but, you know, they, they, those guys just want to go home. Those guys just want to come to work, go home to their wives and kids at the end of the day. They're not trying to fight a revolution, you know. So if you come out strong enough, you can kick them out, and they'll be like, hey, okay, we don't, we don't want to build your neighborhood anymore either, and they'll move on. You know, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. But that would be a strategy I would take if I was like, or Black Lives Matter or something. <laughs> I like it. I, I, I think you're right. Uh, cops don't, don't want more work to do. And if you come in and say, hey, this is our own thing, this is our own area, you don't need to come here anymore, we're going to do for us, and we'll have our own offer up like a business to provide like policing-type activities for this area. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I see that that would be a, an attractive look, they, thing. That police department, his crime rate might go look better, you know. We're excluding this whole part of town. You know, our, our stats right. don't look that bad now. Hey. <laughs> right, yeah, our crime rate went way down. Yeah, isn't, that what, isn't that what happened in the Detroit, you know, when they uh, went bankrupt and couldn't afford to pay for, you know, police and maintenance and schools and all that? Didn't some private services come come up and provide that instead of the police? Yeah, I only I know, know about that. the guy the guy that Tom Woods interviewed. Uh, we, he has his own little private... Uh, Private security thing where you know he he, fer he mainly services you know high income folks you know businesses and high income people but with as, as he makes so much money from that he's able to kind of subsidize the low income section of their work so they could you know police some of the uh, low income neighborhoods and stuff like that I mean I'm looking at it, it's interesting stuff I, I, it's hard for me to find anything about him like in the news or anything like that so I, I kind of I do kind of question it like hey, is this real because it's so unbelievable. Even though it's what we preach, we it's still so unbelievable, you know. With that, yeah. you know. So, but it, it, yeah, I mean, I don't see why it wouldn't work, you know. Because if you think about it, we ask the police to do so much, you know. Well, not we, but the state asks the police to do so much. All these laws. Think about all, you know, millions of laws that they have to enforce. Like, what if they only had to deal with property crime, you know, assault, murder, you know, rape, you know, all that stuff, violent acts. Yeah. Like what just those like ten or fifteen things. That's all they had to worry about. Think how much time they would have on their job. But instead they have to worry about is the guy jaywalking, you know, is he going six miles over the speed limit, 
you know, did, you know, let me let me get my quota. So let's start a uh, let's start a DWI checkpoint. Take 20 police cars, put them mm-hmm. in this area, and just jack people up to see if they have insur- updated insurance or an updated license. Is it funny? <laughs> the funny thing with that is that's government trying to act like a business. They're trying to <laughs> generate revenue. That's all they're doing, man. That's all. I mean, they just started this thing down here in New Orleans where they uh. They take these dummy cars and they put the uh, the camera on there, the speeding light camera, and they just park them all over the neighborhoods just to try to catch people going five miles over the speed limit. I guess just stealing money to me. I guess literally just I'm stealing your money. You know what I mean? Yeah. Imagine if somebody else did that to you. That's, that's terrible. That's not the right. case. And, and, you know, and Capistan wouldn't have something like that. But I don't think it will be as insidious, you know. <laughs> like that's some sick stuff. Like just to have like a fake car sitting there and it's just, it's stealing your money, man. Like that is, that's all it's doing. Just for you going five miles over the speed limit. Well, that's, not all the that's all the government does, right? It's unreal. It's unreal. Well, hey, let's let's uh, bring it back to Selma a little bit. Um, one of the funny things I saw in it towards the end was when LBJ said to King that he's sick and tired of being told what he can and cannot do. And I thought that was a delicious irony because that's pretty much what the president does. What you government does. What the can and cannot do, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, LBJ was a trip, man. I mean, I I read a little about him. I watched like there was another movie that came out on HBO with uh with uh, Bill Cranston. He played LBJ, mm-hmm. and he was interesting, you know, because I mean, for every other aspect, he was a racist guy, you know. I mean, he, maybe not racist, but prejudiced at least, you know. I read a book by his driver. He had a black driver that drove for him, and he would just call him the N word all day, just nonstop, just N word, mm-hmm. give me this, nigga, give me that, you know. So it was. <laughs> I mean, if we, if we, you know, if people knew that part about him, you know, maybe they would think different of him, or they just ignore it now. But, you know, he was, but he was a, you know, he was obviously a Democrat and just a, you know, a kind of a finger in the wind politician. That, you know, hey, I'm just going to do whatever that'll give me the best legacy and that'll keep me going. You know. Yeah. He, he was always interesting to me. Yeah, they don't got no principles. None, none whatsoever. Like he literally had no principles. It was just like, yeah, <laughs> whatever works best today. You know. Well, he's actually, you know, he's pretty famous. I know uh, one of my teachers back in high school, um, it's actually his favorite president, and all because of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And for some reason, I mean, everybody seems to like it, especially lefties and whatnot, really love the Civil Rights Act. But this is what it does. It outlawed discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And on the face, you go, well, people shouldn't discriminate based on that. But doesn't this really get into thought crime where... Somebody doesn't hire somebody, and you go, well, why didn't you hire somebody? It's like, well, I have my reasons. Well, what are those reasons? Well, and you're going to evaluate him on his reasons, and you're going to judge him for his reasons, whether or not he wants to associate with somebody or not. Uh, it's, it really seems like the thought, thought police on whether or not you decided of how or why to hire somebody or to hang out with somebody and how you're not allowed to do that. Um, uh, it, it, from a libertarian point of view, I, I think people have a reason, you know, uh, a right to associate or not associate with whoever they want. If they want to hire all white people or all people named Robert, and that's fine. You're you're cutting yourself off from a potential labor pool of better candidates. But if that's what you want to do, I don't have the right to tell you not to do it. I don't have a right to stick a gun in your face and make you not do it. So for me, the Civil Rights Act is horrible. Um, but anyway, yeah, no, I mean, when you look at it, you know, I mean, it, it basically it was the start of. I mean, I don't say I, w- I won't say it was the start, but it was a big impetus of government invasion into private business, private yeah. lives, and you know, deciding what's right and what's wrong and how you live, you know, and that's basically basically what it led to, you know, because sure you could say. Uh, you know, hey, you shouldn't discriminate on hiring anybody. But how do you decide who's discriminating? You know, if I come right. to your business, if I come to your business and you have twenty uh, nineteen white people working and one black, you know, that means I have to come in and say, no, you need three more black people, or you need three more yeah. minorities. And that was funny. Right. That was the thing. It didn't. It didn't specifically say black people. It just meant, you know, race, sex, religion, this and that. So they kind of they mm-hmm. softened the tone a little bit right there. But yeah, that's basically what they're saying. And I mean, when you look at it, it's just it's just not right. But, you know, I mean, are you, I read in some places, even down south, there was already a movement to end these, you know, 
public accommodation businesses like restaurants and such to where they allowed, you know, they allowed black people. They took down the color-only signs. I mean, they pulled put, put down the white-only signs. And mm-hmm. that was happening, you know, slowly, you know, but not fast enough for, uh, you know, the civil rights groups, you know. But even after they passed that, you could still, if you had a restaurant or a public accommodations type of business, you could still discriminate, but you had to change, like, the uh, status of your business to, like, a private club. So even down south in Mississippi and Louisiana, you had these restaurants that became private clubs, and you'd have to get on, like, some kind of membership list. And it lasted for a couple of years, but eventually it just died because, you know, they weren't making any money, you know, because people well, yeah. the, you know, it just didn't work. You yeah, know? you're not getting all your possible clientele, man. Exactly. And, I mean, so this guy here next door, he's taking whites, blacks, Hispanics, everybody. He's making tons of dough. Meanwhile, you have a membership list of whites only, you know, a safe space. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but you're broke, but you're broke, you know. So... <laughs> You know, the economic laws always come into play, and I think eventually economic laws would have came into play, you know, if, if you know, blacks and other minority groups would have grown in, you know, an economic impact, you know. I think you would have saw those things change, but, you know, some people want things quicker, you know. They're not willing to wait, you know. Yeah, I'm a little bit torn because the whole movie is, is they're begging the government to change the laws. And, you know, the Jim Crow laws were government laws. Slavery was government laws. Um and as much as, you know, I have a distaste as a libertarian anarchist for the Civil Rights Act, like Robert was saying, you know, of course, his association, it does seem like the events that occurred on a social level needed to occur to make um, some impact in how people were treated. I mean, it, it does seem that there was a positive outcome as a result of it, not the laws, but, you know, that people are seen as uh, being treated more equally, you know, not, not the yeah. quality of outcome, but equality of opportunity. Yeah, which I, I mean, can now we, time. yeah, I mean, now we look at it like, hey, this would never happen. This outcome would have never happened without that happening. Maybe it would have. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. Or maybe we still would have been living in a segregated society. You know, I don't know. I can't. I can't answer that because we we didn't get the chance to see. You know, so I, you know, I, I I had the same struggle. Like of all the libertarian issues, this was one of the ones. It took me a long time. You know, people would I read Lou Rockwell, and he'd be like, no public accommodations, people. Need to be able to discriminate how they want. I kind of went at it like, eh, you know, it kind of sucks, man. I like to, you know, there's some restaurants I like to go to, you know. What if, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, what if they had a whites only sign, man? I couldn't enjoy that steak I like, you know. And, you know, you just kind of think like that. But then after I kind of just talking to people and just starting to wrap my mind around it, you start to kind of understand that, you know, it was the government pushing this issue. You know, if the government just got out of the way, even if you go back to uh, Plaggy versus Ferguson. You know, when the black kid from New Orleans, you know, he sat on the uh, train, a whites-only train car, and he wanted to be seated in the whites-only area. Then he sued the sued the, uh, the train car company, and you know, the so the the, uh, the Supreme Court eventually passed. You know, they made it some made some declaration of, you know, hey, it's separate but equal. You know, you can have what you want, you know, but you have to have it separate. You know, that was the government coming in to interfere. Let entrepreneurs figure that problem out. You know, maybe, if, you know, some white people want to have their own train car, they have to pay five bucks extra, you know. Like yeah. you want to have their own train car, they have to pay. Maybe you have some white and blacks that, hey, they like to hang out together. They pay a certain price and let the market kind of figure it out, and eventually things kind of work this stuff out through the market, you know. So you're not going to get the perfect outcome all the time, but at least the people get to decide what they want, you know. I mean, there, I'm, there, I'm sure there are some country clubs. I know there are some country clubs in America that are whites only. I could go and try to apply. They would say no, you know, and they have every right to do so, even under today's laws, you know. But that's okay, you know. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. You know? Yeah, and doesn't, and doesn't uh, government action, I mean, you can't legislate human behavior through government action. Doesn't it, all it do is really just kind of make it hidden? So you're not going to get rid of racism by saying, oh, racism is now illegal. You're just kind of hiding it so that whites only sign gets put away. And then the black guy goes in the restaurant, and then they're spitting in his food. But right. he didn't know that there were a bunch of racists in there. He said it wouldn't have been better sure. if that sign had still been out front. Right. And I've, I've always said this, even before I was a libertarian. I'm like, I like to know who the racists are. You know, I would rather know. I would rather know who to give my money to. You know. Yeah. Why, why would I want to go to a business that literally doesn't want me in there? You know, why would I give him money? But you know, I talked to some people. You know, I used to go back and forth with it. You know, I used to talk to my, my mom. She would talk about how she had to walk like miles get to the, the store that allowed black people to shop there. You know, meanwhile, 
Like literally right around the block, there was a, a store where only mm-hmm. white people could go. And, you know, it's, it just always would drive her crazy because her mom, her mom would ask her, I need you to run to the store to go buy a toy so and buy some bread. And she just knew she had to walk like six miles, knowing there's a store right there, you know, to get what she needs. So, I mean, I could understand their mind frame back then, like, oh, this sucks. Like, this is what's, you know, what, why can't we just go to this store right here? You know, why, why can't they just look at us as humans? We just want to eat just like everyone else. Right. Know? So I understand it, you know. I, I get it. But when you're dealing with people, you're dealing with human beings, man, you can't get the outcomes you want instantly. You know, only government try to, tries to create that, and even then that outcome, you know, that outcome comes with caveats. You know, and, yeah, you might get what you want, but there's a cost. There's always a cost, you know. It makes me right. think there was something holding that together, uh, and I, I got to think it was government. I mean, like you were saying, the economics of it would, would lead people to compete for customers. And, you know, if you're going to self-restrict your, your, your clientele, you're going to put yourself at a disadvantage. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it depends. I guess, you know, if, in some areas, if it was you had a real small, you know, black population, you know, there probably wouldn't have been a di- much of an economic difference if you allowed them a night. I mean, you know, maybe, you know, their clientele just didn't want to be bothered with, you know, people of you know, different races, you know, so... You know, maybe it made economic sense for them, but it also opened up opportunities. You know, maybe another store comes in and say, hey, I move closer. I see an opportunity here. You know, there's no store within six miles. I can put my store right here and sell to blacks and whites, you know. Yeah. And, hey, it makes money, you know. It's just it's just not the quick solution we've come accustomed to looking for, you know, and only, only the government comes in and, you know, snaps their fingers and uses a gun to force those solutions. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and the irony of uh, affirmative action, which – was it a part of the Civil Rights Act, or was it something that came a little bit later? But it, in an effort to eliminate racism, it actually introduces race yeah. as a uh, deciding factor. factor. Right. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was a part of the uh, Civil Rights Act. Maybe part of it was, but it's kind of been bubbling. It was kind of bubbling through every like presidential, you know, presidential uh, cabinet or whatever, you know. But eventually, I think it really grew in the seventies, you know, under, of, of Nixon. Like Nixon, people like to talk about LBJ, but Nixon like expanded all the bad stuff. Like he expanded Great Society, the war on the poor, the war, the war on drugs, you know, affirmative action, all that stuff. He he blew all that up, you know. Yeah, and he came in on all of these uh, free market ideas, right? That was his rhetoric. He yeah, comes yeah, in with he, price controls and devalues the dollar, all the stuff you were just saying. Like he's terrible, just he's terrible. Awful, man. I mean, he came in on like the whole Southern strategy. Strategy. He was like, you know, hey, I'm a you know, these angry whites down south, I'm going to try to use them to get me, you know, get some votes out of them, you know, and he said the right things. You know, and uh, and he just, you know, I don't know, he just did every every bad thing imaginable he did. I guess the only good thing he did was kind of like normalize uh, relations with China, you know, and pulled out of Vietnam. Well, I don't even know if he, you know, I don't know if he would give him credit for pulling out of Vietnam, but, yeah, I mean, he, he was terrible in every aspect. <laughs> yeah, I give the Vietnamese credit for that. I, I, yeah. the Americans like trying to get the hell out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But, you know, you know how that goes. You could have had a guy in there that would just double down, like just a nuke him or something like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I just want to add a little more controversy to the show. We, we need some more listeners. No, nah, man, but, um, yeah, affirmative action, like, that's one of the things, even before I was a libertarian, when I was just a normal Democrat, it just never set right with me. You know, it just, like, it just you know, it's just wrong. I mean, like, everything about it is just wrong. Like, at the end of the day, you know, you should be, you know, hired or, you know, Granted, you know, admission because of your, you know, because of how good you do, because of your merits, you know, period, you know. Uh, if somebody wants to give you an opportunity because they think you're a sympathy case, you know, that's fine, but don't make that a law, you know. Don't make that the law of the land, you know, which is it is terrible, and it has so many other disastrous effects. I know me personally, uh, when I, I remember I started my first job when I got out of, got out of school, I was working for the, uh, I was working for the Army uh, as a contractor, and, uh, you know, there was this, there was, a, there was one guy there that kind of thought I got hired through a friend of affirmative action or whatever. I wound up finding out, like, oh, he's one of those token guys. This guy. But it was, you know, it was a majority black base that I was working at. But it really wasn't. And it was funny because when I talked to my boss, he actually thought I was white when he hired me because we interviewed over the phone. He was like, hey, man, you know, I thought you was a white guy. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I thought you were white too. And he was like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was all good. You know, and I, I always, I never did fill out that section on applications. You know, the EOE section where you got to identify yourself. Like I was, mm. I would never fill that part out. I just I always thought, like, man, if you're gonna hire me, hire me because you want me. Hire me because my resume is good and I give a real good interview. 
You know, right. I don't want to work anywhere where I'm just kind of giving because I'm always going to be, I'm always going to be looking at the back, you know, looking behind myself, wondering like, wow, when am I going to get fired? You know, if, I, if I wasn't good enough to get in, how am I good enough to maintain this job? You know, and I think a lot of people deal with that. A lot of you know minorities and or even women, you know, women use affirmative action a lot. You know, I think that ends up putting them in situations where they can't win. You know. Yeah, and we'll do the pay gap on another show, but it's. Spoiler alert, bullshit. No, that's that's great. I think, uh, uh, who was it who was a professor who was assigning um, a book for people to read and they would come back and argue, like, this author's racist and terrible and all this shit, and uh, come to find out it's Thomas Sowell and he's a black guy. I think that was Tom Woods. I'm not sure. I think that was a Tom Woods story, I think. Could have been someone else. Yeah, it always comes down to identity, right? Like, you know, who said it? Oh, well, you know, if you're if you're white, you can't know about the black experience or the you know what have you experience. And um, I, I don't like that argument. You know, I mean, I, I think there is a, a nugget of truth to it. Like, obviously, I'm not living as you know, whatever that uh, situation is, wh- whatever I'm talking about. But I am a human being, and I have a capacity to learn and understand, and I can see reason and logic. And you know, so just to discount it because I'm not, you know of a particular race or in a particular situation personally doesn't mean I can't have a conversation about it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I don't know if any, I don't know if everybody has that ability, you know. Well, I've always tried to put myself in other people's shoes, you know, always. You know, it's, no matter what the situation was, why, I always try to say, why would they make that decision, you know. And I try to understand it from their point of view, you know. And sometimes you can't explain it. Sometimes it makes no sense. But at least try to look at it from their point of view, you know. So I look at something like a friend of a affirmative action, I just imagine myself, you know, you work hard, you get, you know, 4.0 GPA, you get all your scores in order, you're ready to go to college, but, you know, nope, you can't get in, but, you know, why? You know, eh, we, we found somebody else, you know, they didn't do as good as you, but, hey, sucks, man, you know, go to community yeah. college, you know, <laughs> find somebody else to go, you know, I mean, that would, that would crush me, you know, that crushes a lot of people, you know, and that creates resentment, you know, and that creates you know, these racial, you know, race, racism, it creates racism, prejudice. You know, it creates all these, you know, all these feelings and resentments in people that lead to, you know, Donald Trump being president or somebody like that, you know? But, yeah, I mean, that, that's politics in general, man. It's, it's divisive. It, it cuts people out into little groups and, and pits them against other groups, uh, all for their political gain. Right, because who, who complains the most to the government gets the, the grace. And they, all they do is take from one group and give to another. So, yeah, it's built in divide to and conquer, create resentment. Yeah, Dividing the conquer it works. You know, it works. The yeah. government loves it. You know, they love – that's why the left is pushing this whole SJW, you know, breaking down everybody into these gender roles and 100 gender pronouns. And they want to break it down as far as they can, you know, to get all of these little groups on their side, you know, because it just – it only helps them. You know, it only helps the states. Meanwhile, the Republicans, you know, the Republicans used to do the same thing, you know, they, you know, you had all your little, you know, right-wing groups that they would try to try to promote. I mean, they did it at a lesser extent. I think identity politics politics is mostly a left-wing thing, but I think in general it's it's a government thing. Like, it's a state thing. The state likes identity politics, you know. Yeah. You know, I think uh, the Trump phenomenon is, is, a, is a situation where they went too far and they made uh, everyone else not in one of these little special snowflake groups be this other giant group, like the deplorables, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it made, like, all these little factions of leftist groups, and they were all divided, you know, like uh, Bernie fans and then uh, women who liked Hillary, for whatever reason, uh, and, and there was a lot of infighting there, so there was separation, but then they labeled everyone who was um, against both Bernie and Hillary as evil and deplorable and stupid and Neanderthal and racist and whatever, I mean, you name it. Uh, and it's... You know, it's it's what brought them all together, right? It, it was a common enemy. Like, this mass of groups was the enemy to, um, you know, because I think that a lot of people who voted Trump were feeling um, attacked in a way. And I don't mean it in a physical sense. I, I mean it in a um, talk shit about sense. I mean, I, I watch it, man. I, I just watch it on social media. Like, if you said not even something nice about Trump, if you just said, oh, he's not too bad here, you know, he's not too bad on this issue, it's like, oh, what the fuck? <laughs> you don't know what the hell are you talking about? Like, wow, like, where are we? You know, where are we you know, in society today? It's, it's kind of scary, you know, but that's where we are. You know, you just, I, I can't, I can't even explain it. I, you know, I don't, 
I'm not a Trump lover. I'm not. I'm just like he's. I think he's just a creature of today. You know, he's a creature. He's where we are today, and as, as the United States and as you know, people trying to figure this out, this whole identity thing. You know, economics. I think I really do think it all comes down to economics. I really do think, you know, past eight years after the after the recession, I think people are hurting worse than the news is saying. I think there's a large segment. I mean, I was looking at some stats the other day. Uh, something like forty. Forty percent of blacks are on some type of government assistance month to month. I mean, forty percent. Like that's just unreal, man. I mean, almost half the like forty million people are on food stamps. I mean, people in the United States are on food stamps. I mean, it's just unreal, man. I mean, people people either are hurting and they're they're living off the government and they don't know what the government is doing. Are they are they doing enough or not doing not doing enough or they're doing too little? You know, I think people are just frustrated and they're just looking for answers. You know. They'll vote for anybody at this point. Just say something. Say something that you know makes me feel better today. I'll vote for you. you know. Yeah, and Trump was of the two candidates. He was the change candidate, regardless yeah. of all his flaws. And obviously, no I'm not a fan, it. but he was absolutely a, re- a rebuttal to eight years of Obama. Absolutely, like it's <laughs> he's, he's the opposite. You know, it, it's just funny to me. I just, I just, I just am happy to see Clinton go, man. I mean, I just couldn't stand her so much. It was just nice to see her just lose in flaming fashion like that, you know. Wasn't it glorious? <laughs> <laughs> like, she didn't even say anything after that. Like, I remember that night she sent, uh, uh, what's his name, Podesta, sent him out. Like, hey, we're going to talk about this in the morning. Y'all can go home. <laughs> like, that was it. That was her. I just imagine her, yeah. like, in the back just, I don't know, crying or just staring at the wall in the mirror or something. Or having, having a, having a, having a right. attack or something. I don't know. She didn't have a uh, concession speech written out, for sure. No. No. At all. No, none of those people thought that she was going to lose. It was a, a big shock. Yeah. And it was a huge rejection. Like, how could how could so many people vote for for Trump? They must all be... I can't believe America is just full of racist, bigoted homophobes. Man, listen, I have, I have my, like, my personal Twitter account. I mostly follow, like, uh, mutual sports fans and uh, football fans and stuff like that. And most of them are apolitical, but... They lean left, and just the stuff I see on my timeline is just, I just get tired of it. Like, racist? How can you support a racist, a white supremacist? I'm like, dude, do you know what a white supremacist is, man? Like, do you really know what a white supremacist is? A guy that shaves his head, has like this big swastika tattoo on his chest, you know, that's trying to kill blacks and Jews. Like, that's a white supremacist. You know, some guys against affirmative action, and you know, you know, and, and says, hey, white people aren't too bad. Even right. White supremacy. <laughs> right. It's just ridiculous at this point. Like, I don't even like. I don't. I used to like you know arguing and debating those people. I just can't even do it anymore because it, you debate when you debate them, you're debating at their level, and you can't win at their level, you know, unless you uh, you know unless you go the alt alt right route. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not alt right, but that's that, that's why I understand where the alt right comes from because if you want to you want to debate them at their level, you got to get down in the dirt with them. Yeah. Yeah, I almost consider them not worth converting at this point, you know. Like, they're not going to listen to reason. They're not going to listen to philosophical argument. Uh, they're kind of a lost cause. Lost cause, man. Yeah, so, hey, I have one last thing on, on Selma before we, we can start to wind this down. It feels like we've been on for quite a while. Uh, not not to, you know, disrespect you at all, at all, Ryan. This is late for me, and I know it's later for you. Uh, you've been a great guest, by the way, so I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you gave Liam a run for his money. Uh, he was our <laughs> other guest. Oh, cool. <laughs> But uh, yeah, towards the end of the film, LBJ has George Wallace in uh, the White House, and he's saying, hey, it's your state, it's your responsibility, it's your problem. And I thought that was um, kind of a nod to a states' right thing, states' rights thing, which I think was more of an issue back then. And um, yeah. you know, if, if we're going to talk about a spectrum of politics, I think that I would prefer to have states have more power than the federal government. Um, granted, neither one's legitimate in my mind. But um, there was a point where you know, LBJ is like berating him about this, saying it's your problem. But then Wallace uh, chides back at him, like, oh, well, you want to distribute wealth or redistribute wealth. Um, kind of like cut back at LBJ. And I thought that was kind of interesting because it was, um, I think, presented in the film to connote um, George Wallace being this you know, evil racist politician and the distribution of wealth and that idea of kind of painting it in a bad light, in a negative light. So that was the one political uh, message that I was able to divine from this um, outside of the story in that they were trying to um, sort of conflate him with uh, a negative view of, of a redistribution of wealth, like saying that 
a racist wouldn't want to redistribute wealth, but a, a normal, reasonable person is totally fine with it. Right. No, it's true. You know, it's true. And it, they, that's how the left has tried to portray it for the longest. You know, they, they view capitalism as the racist ideology and distribution of wealth and socialism as a egalitarian equality type of uh, ideology, you know. Hey, can, yeah. I, can I pause for one second? I'm on mute. I need to go run and handle it. I'll be one minute. Sure. All right, I'll be right back. Man, no problem. We've got plenty to say about you now, man. All right, go ahead. <laughs> can you believe that guy? No, just kidding. Um, no, yeah. I think he, he's been an awesome guest, don't you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, to his point, yeah, capitalism is constantly being painted as the, not only as the tool of the oppressor, but as the uncaring, whereas the redistribution is the compassionate thing. Never mind the fact. They always look at the end of it. They never look at the beginning of it. Like, where did you get the money to begin with? Oh, with a gun in somebody's face. Oh, well, yeah, but we just have this money. It's just there. I mean, it's just that's just the system. That's just what it's there for. So why not just distribute it? Yeah. Right, and they miss, like, where the person who had the money got the money. You know, they provided a service, a service. That, that somebody wanted. Somebody want. And so then they earned a profit out of that. So if anything, the person providing that service actually bettered uh, another person's life already and then has the hand of government come in, shove a gun in their face and say, well, now we want you to do something better for someone else in our estimation. And by the way, we're going to take a huge cut of it uh, in bureaucracy and other bullshit and, and dribble out a couple of crumbs out to the to the people that were, you know, marketing-wise, like, appearing to help. Right. And is altruism at the point of a gun altruism at all? I would no. say no. I uh, know it is. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, True charity is, is only comes from when you have the wealth to provide it. Uh, so if you're just stealing everybody's money and at the point of a gun and then redistributing it, that's not, that's not charity, that's not altruism. That's just theft and redistribution. Um, but when you actually have the money, you don't get all your money stolen from you. You're far more likely to hey, help out somebody that's in need. Yeah, I remember in one of the lectures um, in the... Austrian economics course from the Mises Institute. Uh, they talk about how the Red Cross, I think, was offered a million dollars back in the 1920s from the federal government. And they said no. They're like, hey, if, if everyone hears that you gave us a million dollars, they're going to stop donating to us. And we'll get far more from people uh, just normally. Uh, but if they think that you've given us a million dollars, they're not going to give us money. You know, right, so because of the situation would have been taken care of in their eyes. Right, which is right. kind of how government portrays itself as taking care of all these situations, and of course they're inept about it. Um, so I think that as much charity as does exist today, even with all this taxation and, and all these government programs that proclaim to be um, helping the needy and the homeless and less fortunate, um, Americans are still by far and away, uh, I believe this is the statistic, giving more than any other um, country or society uh, in the world. And just imagine if they didn't think it was already being taken care of with money that was already being taken from them, like how much more giving people would be. And if they had that 30 or 40 percent more of their income exactly. to be generous with. Yeah, so I think we filled that time while you were gone, Ryan. Yeah, yeah, good time. Good time. <laughs> so uh, I don't want to leave this show without mentioning Morgan Freeman. Um, Ryan, you and I talked about him briefly on the, on the, other, on the call the other day, and uh, he was on 60 Minutes probably – uh, 15 years ago now, and they were asking him about Black History Month and uh, and how he would want to deal with racism. And he said, "Well, how would you feel about if there was a White Month? You know, which which month is White Month?" And he said, "Well, I, I'm I'm Jewish." The, the interviewer guy said, "All right, which which month is Jewish Month?" And the guy uh, shot back, "Well, you know, how do you want to deal with racism?" And Morgan Freeman, like a boss, says, "Stop talking about it. You know, stop making a big deal about it. We're just we're just people. We're just individuals. You know, so that that Morgan Freeman guy, I can get behind him too." He's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. No, that was great. A lot of, <laughs> and if you post that clip now, that, that clip has been to posted like on Twitter, and like the you know the Black Lives Matter folks and the SJWs and all those guys, they can't stand it. They're like, oh, that coon, that Uncle Tom, living in Hollywood too long, blah 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 blah. You know, so you know. Well, they can't gotta, stand racism not being the narrative. They everything they, they see, they like view the world in like this, whether somebody's racist or not, prism. You know, they know they like to put people in boxes of, oh, this is person's obviously a racist because he voted for Trump or whatever. They think they know racism better than Morgan Freeman, who grew up in, you know, southern part of Mississippi. You know, was born like, I don't, think, I don't know when he was born. He seems like he's been a 
old as hell forever. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he, you know, he came up. He probably dealt with all kinds of crap. You know, he had to fight it. But he didn't get into movies until like late in his career because he had to work through the whole circuit. You know, Broadway. But yeah, they know they know more about racism than him. You know, and that's right. one thing that that always drives me crazy, especially with these the younger generation. Not to not to get on a whole. You know, oh those darn millennials. I'm not trying to do that, but you know, they just they think they know it all, of course, and they right. think they know. Like you, they have no idea how, how they would have dealt with what their fathers and grandfathers went through back in the day. You know, I mean, they people really dealt with crap. You know. And you're sitting here crying because somebody doesn't agree with a political view, you know? So that they need a safe space. And, yeah, yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. They are the cupcake generation, no doubt. It's unbelievable, you know? These people got spit in the face. They got, you know, kicked, punched, sprayed with water hoses, you know, ran out of town. Towns were burned down, you know? These things happened, and they had to live with that, you know? And that's all, it's almost like a spit in the face to that, to that generation. Say what you want about that generation, and what came out of it, be it, you know, the civil rights era and stuff like that. But that, you know, that took guts to do that stuff back then, you know. I don't know if I'd have had the guts. Because most black people didn't take part in the civil rights organizations and stuff like that. I talked to my mom and asked her about, like, you know, how she dealt with racism back then. She was like, she really didn't see it. You know, I mean, she just, you know, black people stayed on their side of town, white people stayed on theirs, and you just, you just kind of lived life. You really didn't, wasn't really exposed to it until you got older and, you know, you started mm-hmm. going out in the world a little more. You know, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's so most people back then, you know, even they were kind of separated from you. People figure out how to live their lives, you know. And just, so just imagine if the state just got out the way, you know. Imagine, the, imagine the, you know, the potential lying, you know, within us, you know. Yeah, if they just get out the way. Uh, yeah, that's one thing that the movie really, I thought, came across really well was just um, how intelligent and brave MLK was. He really did, he was standing up against, you know, the biggest group of violent thugs in the world. So it's no small, no small feat what he did. No, not at all, man. I, I, I enjoy it. I mean, those guys, you know, I think he's, you know, he's a very important figure in history. Like him or not, he made a major impact, man. I mean, he, you know, he really shook it up, you know. Mm-hmm. As, a, as a libertarian, you know, you can look at him how you want. But he's somebody you have to talk about, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, so Ryan, before we wind this down, I want to ask about, um, there's a controversy between Trump and John Lewis, who was, he was actually in the march with MLK at Selma, and now he's, uh, is he a congressman or a senator? I don't recall. Uh, congress, congressman. Congressman, yeah. And uh, Trump was saying that, you know, his district is in bad shape and he's all talk, no action, because he was, um, Lewis was saying that, that he believed the Russian hacking makes Trump an illegitimate president. I mean, yeah. I agree he's an illegitimate president, but I have nothing to do with Hacking any president would have been illegitimate in my mind, but uh, all these people are rushing to Lewis's defense by saying, "Oh, you know, it's MLK Day, and uh, he was this great black activist, and all those things." And sure, that's fine, I agree, but typical, it doesn't make him right. This is just typical liberal response, you know. I mean, they, you know, this, you know, Lewis literally tells the incoming president, "You know, you're illegitimate." Which I mean, think about that. Really, think of, I mean, think of where we're at now. I mean, they, usually at this point, even the opposition is, you know, at least viewing the incoming president as legitimate. You know, they're not, they're not super disrespectful. They're just like, oh, we're going to work with the incoming president and we're going to try to get what we need for our people and our constituents. You know, that's usually the way. But now it's just like, I mean, it's just crazy, you know. And so, okay, I mean, he knew, Lewis knew what Trump's response would be, you know. He knew he would get a response. And liberals respond back. Oh no! Don't go hard on him. He, was, he marched with Martin Luther King, and he was he was in the dirt fighting. He was getting punched on the bridge. You know, like yeah. Now you want to bring that up? You know, mm. it's, it's media crap. You know, I, I I don't think I've even made a comment on it since all that's been going down because it's just stupid to me. You know, I mean, it's it's just like it's like you know what what where, where are we going here? You know, <laughs> but it's it's just using it as another example. Of, hey, look, Trump's a racist. You know. Right, and Trump's not even talking about his civil rights uh, activities. He's talking about, you know, hey, you're calling me illegitimate, and you know, wherever you represent Georgia is, like, in bad shape or, you know, whatever. Like, It's been for years, like decades, you know. But he's, yeah. he's always held, because he, he will always hold that, he has the cushiest job in the, in, the, in the world, you know. I mean, he gets voted in every year just because every year he comes out, every time it's time to run, he pulls out the old photographs of him sitting at the table with Martin Luther King and walking down, 
down the bridge with Martin Luther King. Hey, I was right there with him. So he pulls that card every time, but he's done nothing. You know, he's he's done nothing for you know for black people or anybody for that matter. You know. Yeah, I haven't heard much uh, about him other than this, and and when he did the uh, sit-in at in the floor of Congress about gun control. Oh, you remember that? It looked so stupid. That was yeah. <laughs> and then uh, they were they were trying to play it off like it was like a hunger strike kind of deal, but then there was some behind the scenes like photos that people got, and they had catered sandwiches or something. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> Stupid man, it's like you, you're a little too old for that, not buddy. You know, right, but those like those people, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, like those are you know, the whole race thing was the cottage industry for them. You know, because after the civil rights thing, you know, it was like okay, now what? You know, we don't, we're not skilled in anything else. You know, right. so they created careers, you know, in race, race baiting and racial issues. You know, I remember uh, when uh, you, you guys remember the Jenna Six. In the sixth thing, you remember? Jenna six. Yeah, it was like these black kids in high school it was down here in Louisiana, and there's some white kid hung up a noose or something in, 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 in like the lunchroom, and they got in a fight with the black kids, and then the black kid got charged with attempted murder because he punched the white kid or something. It was a big thing some years ago, but it, mm. uh, this is one of those little media fringes. It sounds big, familiar. Was, yeah, I mean, it's, nobody talks about it now because. The kid that punched the white kid, he eventually started. They let him. They dropped the charges eventually, about you know the attempted murder charges. But he still got in trouble later. He was like robbing people, and you know he wound up becoming just another thug. So nobody likes to bring that up anymore. But anyway, I remember there was this big march in Jenna, Louisiana. You know, and I knew a lot of people that went down there. This was way before I was a libertarian. I was I was all into it. I was like, yeah, Jenna Six. You know, we can't have have people hanging nooses at school. You know, stuff like that. I was into all of that. And uh, I remember a lot of people that went down there, Al Sharpton was there. And they said Al Sharpton was charging people $50 to take a picture with him. Like, all these people that went down there to march with him, he's charging <laughs> them to take a picture with him. You know, and everybody wow. was like, man, he is a piece of shit. Nobody likes him. Like, literally nobody. <laughs> and everybody, I mean, people, I see, like, the alt-right and, you know, some conservatives like to say, oh, Al Sharpton, why do you black people look up to Al Sharpton? I'm telling you from a black person's perspective. Like, nobody likes Al Sharpton. Like, <laughs> like, Democrats, I mean, there's a few, like, the old school guys, they love him, you know, but everybody know what he is. He's just, he's a capitalist, if you want to think about it. I mean, he just try to capitalize on race. That's what he does. You know? Yeah, like any kind of racial tragedy or anything, it seems like he was just like the outrage police. I mean, he's there. If there's something yeah. that happens, you know, first thing he does, calls the family, you know, tries to gender, gender support with him, and, you know, he's coming down. He's coming down with the cameras. He's calling every news crew within 100 miles to make sure they're going to be on the step of the city hall at this time so they can watch him give a speech, and then he's out of town. You know, he's gone. Yeah. But he's got to sign his baseballs and sell them first, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Ridiculous. And those Man. people, the people like that, they've made it worse. You know, they've, these past 40 years, you know, they've made it worse, the whole racial, how we get along with each other, you know. <laughs> because individually, blacks and whites and Hispanics and Muslims and all that, we get along pretty well, no problem. But once you bring these whole collective attitudes into play, that's when things get dicey and our brains automatically trigger into tribalism mode, you know? Right. Where we got to, hey, we got to get with our guys, you know? I thought it was interesting. I was listening to uh, Dave Smith, you know, Dave Smith from... Uh, yeah, Party. part of the problem. Yeah. I was listening to his episode and he was talking about that, that, uh, that white, that the white kid that got tortured in Chicago mm-hmm. that they had on video. Kid that was, he was like, he had mental disability. Just terrible, you know, terrible situation. Right. And even he said when he first saw the video, he had kind of a private reaction, like anger, you know, like, you know, like he started feeling like he was getting like kind of mad at blacks and, you know, screw them, you know, started getting mm. that feeling. But then he had to kind of check himself and, you know, kind of come back to it. But that's like a human reaction, you know, for all of us, you know. And it's not always based on race. Sometimes it's based on class or, you know, where what neighborhood we live in or who's your favorite football team or whatever, you know. Right. But it's kind of a human trait. But I think ultimately... You know, it serves us best to fight that, fight that feeling. Sometimes, sometimes you got you got to embrace that feeling, depending you know what's going on. You know, but you know we we just got we got to use our brains, these big brains that we've been blessed with. You know, we can think bigger than that. We could we could think bigger than a uh, than an animal. You know, we we we've evolved further than that. You know. Yeah, well, that's that's what brought us together, Ryan. Using yeah. those big brains, getting together on the libertarian scene. Yes, sir. Well, hey, why don't we uh, wrap this up unless anyone has any last thoughts on the film or any of the other topics we've talked about. You got anything else there, Ryan? 
Oh uh, no, nah, man, I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys welcoming me on. I, you know, I never, I've done like sports podcasts before, but I've never done any political or libertarian podcasts. So it's a cool experience, just you know, shooting the shit with you guys. So uh, I mean, I'll definitely be checking you guys out moving forward, and uh, I'll try to promote you where I can. I'm just not like I'm some kind of big shot. But man, just keep up the good work, man. Spreading the message, you know, talking about liberty, talking about rock bar, talking about anarchism. You know, it's a long route. You know, we have to take the long view. It's going to be a long time until we get what we want. But hey, let's just, you know, things we're doing right now will make an impact, even if it's just one person listening. You know, it's going to make some kind of impact. I truly believe, anyway. Well, thank you for saying that, Ryan. Sometimes I think uh, we might only have one person listening, but uh, <laughs> I do take. <laughs> I do take that, uh, you know, there is a lesson in this film, and, and it is that, you know, we've got to take the long view. Even if we have the moral uh, right to defend ourselves, maybe, you know, maybe strategically it's not the best thing to do in that particular case. And I'm not saying that, you know, specifically that's what we should do, but I'm taking the, the concept of, hey, maybe the immediate right thing to do isn't the best thing to do. And right. uh, I think there's something to be said for that. Absolutely. Indeed. All right, well, hey, uh, you guys who uh, want to see more from Ryan, you can see uh, his blog at the theafrolibertarian.com. It's, it's with the, right? Yeah, yeah theafrolibertarian.com. The you can also uh, follow me on Twitter at afrolibertarian.com. Uh, try to post as much as I can. I don't post every day, but usually when I do post, I start ranting for a while. So <laughs> Perfect. give me a holler there. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and, and Ryan, you're welcome to post this show if, if uh, after you listen to it and you're, you're not too ashamed of uh, being on the show with us, uh, feel free to post <laughs> it on your blog or on Twitter. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, hey, I want to thank our guests for joining us and uh, just uh, reiterate what we said at the opening of the show. This is the last um, Reed Rothbard podcast where we're going to be doing this um, uh, format under this name. We're going to be transitioning over to uh, the actual Anarchy podcast where we're going to take uh, Robert and I talking about films and libertarian themes where uh, there's examples of anarchy happening in everyday situations. Uh, we are going to continue on with uh, readrothbard.com. We're going to post um, more of uh, Rothbard's lectures and books. We're going to continue uh, with The Enemy of the State, which has his lectures. And we're going to be launching uh, actualanarchy.com uh, in the coming weeks. So we're going to take a little bit of a hiatus in preparation. Uh, so look for us coming out with Actual Anarchy Podcast and actualanarchy.com. In the meantime, continue to check out readrothbar.com, click any of the Amazon links, Liberty Classroom links, readitfor.me links, or our Patreon page, YouTube, Twitter, BuzzFeed. Uh, no, that's not an actual thing. That's fake news. Uh, anyway, you get the idea. Send us a smoke signal, whatever you got. Uh, Robert, you, want, you got anything else you want to add to this? Nope. I am learning my ukulele and uh, don't anticipate anything spectacular anytime soon. My big fat fingers uh, just don't work super good on that tiny little thing, but it was a good idea. And I will have something at some time, probably, maybe. All right. Well, yeah, so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Robert and I used to talk about a book that he's working on in the progress, at least in the first dozen or so episodes of, of our podcast. And in one of his uh, updates, he said that he was going to write a song to do a promotion uh, with a ukulele. And then for Christmas, I got him one. Uh, and uh, we posted that video on YouTube uh, just last night. Uh, so now he has a positive obligation to follow through on what he said he was going to do. And uh, so hopefully, you know, this will uh, push him along in that path. And uh, we'll be able to hear more about his book and the song on the actual Anarchy podcast in coming weeks. So I thank you guys for joining us. I thank Ryan for joining us. You can find more about him at theafrolibertarian.com. Uh, so this is Daniel signing off from the Reed Rothbard podcast. You'll find us again in a couple of weeks on the actual Anarchy podcast. So thank you very much, folks, and good night from me. Take care, everybody. The Chipmunks. C-H-I-P-M-U-N-K. We're the Chipmunks. Guaranteed to brighten your day. Do 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 do